Hi everyone. Today we're going to be looking at how central banks can set the interest rate in our economy. And specifically, we're going to be looking at two ways in which central banks have set interest rates. One, which is a system that they used prior to the global financial crisis, and the second, which they used um, after the financial crisis. But before we do that, we need to talk about what we mean when we say interest rates. When you think about interest rates, you probably think about the interest rate on a mortgage or a credit card or a savings account. But the central bank can't actually set these. But what it can do is it can set the interest rate that banks lend to and borrow from one another. And this is called the interbank market. And the central bank um, takes a role in this market. And by taking a role in this market, it could influence the price of lending, which we also know as the interest rate. So from now on, whenever we talk about interest rates, we mean interest rates in the interbank market. OK, so in order to understand how the central bank can influence these uh, interest rates in the interbank market, we need to understand the market for reserves. So the law requires that all banks have to hold some percentage of their deposits as reserves at the central bank uh, every day overnight. And each bank has to estimate exactly how much money they need to keep overnight with the central bank and that's always going to be a little bit uncertain so they have to estimate it if they put aside too much money they're said to hold excess reserves and these excess reserves pay no interest the central bank doesn't pay the bank any interest on the money that they have to keep with the central bank and because of that these excess reserves have an opportunity cost because the bank could have lent out that extra money to other banks to meet their own reserve requirements um, overnight if they put too little money aside, as I've kind of alluded to, uh, the, the bank needs to borrow money from other banks in order to make their reserve requirement with the central bank. And those banks will pay that uh, lender some interest. So as a result of this, the demand for reserves is downward sloping, as we can see here. So as the interest rate in the interbank market rises, banks will seek to economize their holdings of reserves and try and keep just the bare minimum because the opportunity cost is a lot higher. They don't want to be keeping excess reserves because they could be lending those reserves out and making a return on them. So we see this upward sloping curve. At the same time, the central bank can set the supply of reserves because it has, in theory, an unlimited um, printing capacity. So it can at any time credit banks with as much reserves as it wants to because it has control of the money supply. Um, so as a result, we say that the um, supply is perfectly inelastic. Like so. The central bank, in effect, sets supply. And it's in this way, by setting the supply, that the central bank can set the interest rate in the interbank market. So it tries to estimate the total demand for its reserves on any, any given day and then sets the supply reserves accordingly to achieve its target rate of interest, which we can call I star. Now, if the central bank wishes to change the interest rate, all it needs to do is it needs to alter the supply of reserves. Now, let's say that the central bank decides it wishes to lower the interest rate in the interbank market. What it will do is it will increase its supply of reserves by perhaps um, buying securities off banks and paying them by crediting them reserves with their central in the central bank, which they simply do by printing, in theory, money. So the supply will increase as such. And as a result, the equilibrium interest rate in the interbank market will fall. And it will fall because... As banks are given more reserves by the central bank, they have less need to borrow from one another in order to make those reserve requirements. And the less clamoring there is for borrowing, obviously, the lower the price of borrowing, that's the interest rate, uh, the lower it will become. So the interest rate, we say, falls. And this interest rate targeting forms the basis of the pre-financial crisis system of managing interest rates, which was called the corridor system. Now, it was called the corridor system because the central bank also imposes um, a ceiling and a floor on the interbank market. And it does this, well, it imposes the ceiling 
by setting the interest rate that it charges to lend to banks. So the central bank also lends money to um, banks in order to make their reserve requirements, and it will charge them a certain interest rate in order to do so. Now, because it has unlimited lending capacity, because the central bank can print money, um, no bank, no other bank is going to be able to charge more than the central bank. If the central bank is offering you as much money as you need to borrow at, say, 5%, you're not, you're not going to borrow money from any other bank at, say, 5.5%. So the maximum a bank can charge is going to be that which is offered by the central bank. And finally, it sets the floor on interest rates. And the floor on interest rates um, is set by the interest that the central bank pays on excess reserves. And in this case, in the corridor system, it was 0%. They paid nothing on excess reserves. And the reason it's the floor is because the central bank is the safest place to put your money. So you're never going to accept an interest rate lower than what is being offered by the central bank. If the central bank is a safe place to put your money and they're paying you 0%, you're not going to accept, say, a negative interest rate with another bank because it's never going to be as safe as the central bank. That was the pre uh, financial crisis system. But what happened uh, during the financial crisis is central banks responded with a policy called quantitative easing. And quantitative easing involved buying vast amounts of financial assets um, from a whole load of banks, and they paid for those assets by crediting them extra reserves. And they did this to such an extent that um, the interbank market was flooded with reserves. So what happened was the supply increased to this horizontal point uh, along the demand curve. And at this horizontal point, at this horizontal point along the demand curve, there was no need for any extra supplies, uh, any extra supply of reserves. So every bank held uh, well in excess of the reserve requirements that they would ever be expected by a law to provide for the bank. So because these banks are holding um, well in excess of what they're required, they have no need to borrow from one another. So in a, uh, essentially, the interbank market disappears. Banks no longer need to borrow and lend from one another. And as a result, there's no interbank market interest rate anymore. So how does the bank then, how does the central bank go about um, influencing these, uh, influencing the interest rate? Well, what it does is it began to pay interest on those excess reserves. The excess reserves, as we said from the corridor system, is simply just the floor and interest rates. And this is what we have today, is just the floor system. So it's like the corridor system, except that again, there's no more ceiling and there's no more target interest rate because there isn't any borrowing between banks. But it is still the floor and interest rates because the amount of money, uh, the amount of interest that is paid by the central bank is the lowest um, any other bank is willing to um, receive for their money. They're not going to put their money with a bank that offers less than the central bank is paying them on their ex excess reserves. And in this way, this is what we, when we talk about, when we say that the Fed or the Bank of England has raised interest rates, they're now increasing the interest that they pay on those excess reserves. And that forms the floor of interest rates, which in turn influences the rest of the interest rates in the economy. That's it for today, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I'm going to be doing all of the topics uh, in EC210, but if, if there's anything that you didn't understand in this video or that you would like me to cover in future videos, just leave a comment below.